I have no idea why the new Space Jam is even called Space Jam. The original Space Jam was about aliens from space that wanted to capture the Looney Tunes. But there's no space in the new Space Jam. It has nothing to do with it. A friend of mine said they should just call the movie Jam, because that's really what this is. Trying to jam in as much advertising for Warner Brothers properties into a movie as humanly possible. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Now, I was about 12 years old when the original Space Jam came out, and quite honestly, I didn't really think much of it when I saw it. I mean, it wasn't like I hated the movie or anything like that. I just remember being very unimpressed by it. And I was really into basketball back then. So when I heard that they were making a new Space Jam with LeBron James, I really didn't care. I just figured it would be, you know, another kid's movie that I might check out at some point, just out of curiosity. What I didn't expect is a movie for kids that try so hard to market properties that appeal only to adults. It feels like Warner Brothers knew that the kids who saw the original Space Jam are now adults, and would be taking their kids to see a new Space Jam movie, and this would be the perfect opportunity to capitalize on millennial nostalgia. But I'll get more into that in a minute. The original Space Jam was pretty straightforward in terms of the story it was trying to tell. An alien who runs an amusement park in outer space wants a new attraction, so he sends out a group of small aliens to capture the Looney Tunes and bring them back to make them the new attraction. Of course, the aliens aren't very smart, and Bugs Bunny convinces them that they have to give the Looney Tunes a chance to defend themselves. So because the aliens are small with short arms and legs, they come up with the idea of challenging them to a basketball game. If the aliens win, they take the Looney Tunes. If they lose, they go back to space empty-handed. The aliens agree, but then go out and steal the talent from professional basketball players. And this is where the Looney Tunes realize that they need the help of the best basketball player, Michael Jordan, who is currently retired and attempting to play baseball. The movie does a good job of incorporating the real-life events of Michael Jordan's baseball career and poking fun at it. Baseball bat. Get this guy a tennis racket. And while even as a kid I thought the movie was just okay, it comes as advertised. It's a Looney Tunes movie with Michael Jordan. It carries the same look and feel along with the trademark humor you'd expect from the Looney Tunes. Space Jam A New Legacy, in many ways, is a very different movie. Since this movie is a sequel to the original and not a remake, Obviously, they're not just going to make the same thing with LeBron James in place of Michael Jordan. And I do have to give the writers credit for trying something different to distinguish this movie from the original. But as I mentioned before, there is so much jammed in here that it doesn't feel like a Looney Tunes movie with LeBron James. It's a Warner Brothers mashup that feels unfocused because of its need to shove every Warner Brothers property in your face all the time in an attempt to disguise product placement as self-referential humor. Winter, I say winter is coming! Now, don't get me wrong, every movie or TV show these days has some sort of product placement. Even the original Space Jam had it. Come on, Michael, it's game time. Get your Hanes on, lace up your Nikes, grab your Wheaties and your Gatorade, and we'll pick up a Big Mac on the way to the ballpark. But this takes things to such an extreme that it gets distracting. The movie starts with LeBron wanting his kids to follow in his footsteps, but his son Dom wants to be a game designer and is actually currently developing an arcade-style basketball game by himself. Some people have been critical of LeBron's acting in this movie, but quite honestly, I really wasn't surprised by it. It was kind of expected. I do think Michael Jordan did a better job at acting in the original Space Jam, but whenever it comes to athletes in movies, I always set my expectations pretty low. I mean, they're athletes. They've spent their whole lives focused on sports, not acting. So yeah, LeBron's acting isn't great, but you know, personally, I wasn't really expecting any much more than this. And Warner Brothers knew what they were getting into. They knew what they were doing. They knew who they were signing on. It wasn't an Academy Award winning actor. The goal was to do another Space Jam movie with the best basketball player in the world. Arguably of all time. Arguably of all time. <laughs> Meanwhile, inside of the Warner Brothers computer... Meanwhile, inside of the Warner Brothers computer serververse, a piece of artificial intelligence software named Algae Rhythm is obsessed with LeBron James because, you know, he's so famous and stuff, and the algorithm wants to be famous too. So it hatches this plan to get Warner Brothers to pitch this thing called Warner 3000 to LeBron, 
and it would basically scan him and put him into stuff like Batman and Harry Potter and Game of Thrones and they'll all make a ton of money. It's just too bad that this reaction wasn't the same reaction that LeBron had when they pitched to him the idea of doing this movie. Listen guys, I'm a ball player. You know, an athlete's acting, that never goes well. This idea is just straight up bad. It's among the worst ideas I've ever heard. Top five, easily. Or maybe it was until they backed up the money truck. I don't know. Anyways, LeBron's like, yeah, no, this is stupid. So as they're leaving, Al G Rhythm makes the elevator go down into the basement where they get lost in the massive server room and Dom sees this, I don't know, giant orb and he decides, hey, I'm just gonna go towards that. And this is where he gets sucked into the server verse. So Al G Rhythm introduces himself and then kidnaps Dom and challenges LeBron to a game of basketball. The idea is that the game will be streamed on the internet and will be watched by all of LeBron's followers, and this will help Algy Rhythm fulfill his destiny of being famous. If LeBron wins the game, him and his son can leave, but if he loses, they have to stay in the server-verse forever. I should mention that Don Cheadle is easily the standout in this movie, which should come as no surprise. If it wasn't for him, this would have been much harder to sit through. So he sends LeBron down to the Toon World, and on his way, he passes by all these other worlds, like the Game of Thrones world, the Wizard of Oz world, the Harry Potter world, Casablanca world, the Matrix world. And this is where you really start getting the sense that Marketing properties for adults is gonna be a mainstay throughout this movie. And yes, the vast majority of these properties are for adults. No 10 year old is watching Game of Thrones or The Matrix. You know, I've never had my nephews run up to me and be like, hey, Uncle Mark, let's watch Casablanca. So LeBron lands in the Toon World and you're thinking, okay, this is kind of cool now. It's starting to feel like the Looney Tunes. But this is unfortunately short-lived, as you'll see in a few minutes. It turns out that Bugs is the only Toon left in Toon World because Algy Rhythm convinced all the other characters to leave and check out the other parts of the serververse. So to get the basketball team together, they have to go get the other characters from the other worlds in the serververse. And this is where you can argue, oh, but this is where the space in Space Jam comes into play. You know, it's, it's digital space. Give me a break. It's not space, it's a computer. Now, I do have to say that this was a really creative way of getting them to assemble the team. And while it probably sounded like a great idea on paper, in execution, I think some of it works, but most of it just feels like, once again, Warner Brothers just jamming its properties down your throat and making references that will go completely over the heads of the younger part of the audience. With the exception of maybe the DC superhero stuff and maybe the Harry Potter stuff, no kid is gonna know what this stuff is. Putting the characters into scenes from Mad Max, Austin Powers, and look, replacing Trinity with Granny. Wow, a Matrix joke. I haven't seen one of those since they were done to death 20 years ago. And the humor just doesn't work at all. At least not for adults. Like, look at this. They replaced Mini-Me with Elmer Fudd. And it's, it's funny because they're both bald. You know, that's the joke. Well, maybe, maybe the parents won't find it funny, but the kids will. You know, the kids will love it. They, they'll totally remember that movie that came out 15 years before they were born and is full of non-stop sex jokes. I just don't see people in their 30s finding this type of humor funny. And again, those are the only people who are gonna understand these references. So it all just comes off as so weird. Like, why are you showing us this? So they finally get the team together and you may be thinking, okay, finally, we can just get to the game now. And in the original Space Jam, that's what it was. It may have featured cartoons and aliens, but it was a basketball game. The audience understands the boundaries as to which the competition exists in. In this movie, however, there's so much going on that it's hard to get invested because there's basically no rules. It's not basketball, it's Dom Ball. 
Dom's video game version of basketball. The Looney Tunes are all upgraded, so now everything is in a 3D space. And LG Rhythm gets Dom to scan all these professional basketball players into the game to make it a tough competition for LeBron. Kind of what the aliens did in the original Space Jam with stealing the talent from the NBA players. But there's really no point to this because Algae Rhythm just basically cheats and adjusts the game whenever he feels like it. Also, Algae Rhythm zaps in anyone in real life who is watching the game. You know, it's kind of like Tron. And this raises the stakes because if the Toon Squad loses, all these people will be trapped in the serververse as well. But for some reason, instead of filling the entire audience with real people, which would raise the stakes even more, he fills it mostly with characters from, you guessed it, Warner Brothers properties. And I have to say, I think this is the lamest thing in the entire movie for multiple reasons. First of all, you're not gonna have the original actors playing these characters. This obviously isn't Jim Carrey as The Mask, and this definitely isn't Lawrence Fishburne as Morpheus. So these are just cheap visual representations of these characters, and I think all of this just does a disservice to these characters because it's out of character for them to even be here. Characters from Batman Returns, the Night King and the White Walkers, the agents from The Matrix, Pennywise the Clown, the list just goes on and on. Why would these characters be cheering at a basketball game? Like, is that where the Night King and the White Walkers were really going the whole time in Game of Thrones, you know? Like, they weren't really trying to destroy Westeros, they were just trying to get to the game. You know, the Night King's like, hey, that game's at like seven o'clock, eight years from now. So we gotta start going now, we're walking. Hey, look, it's the Droogs from A Clockwork Orange. Why are they in here? I mean, it's kind of funny when you think about it. Warner Brothers is all like, hey guys, we gotta, we gotta retire this Pepe Le Pew character. It's too controversial, you know? It's kind of, it's kind of sexually aggressive. All right, so for the new Space Jam movie, let's put a gang of violent rapists in the crowd. Everybody cool with that? Once again, I think these characters are just jammed in here for no other reason than to tap into adult nostalgia. Look at the movies these characters are from and when these movies came out. And they're all courtside and clearly in focus, which for me makes it pretty distracting. There's so many things going on from a visual standpoint that I think it detracts from the actual game. This is where I feel like the original Space Jam was just a much more focused movie. There's a joke in here that I actually thought was pretty clever, and that's when they announced that they're bringing in Michael Jordan, and everyone's excited until it turns out that it's Michael B. Jordan, the actor. Okay, so now I'm gonna be talking about the ending of the movie, so spoiler alert in case you were interested in actually watching the movie to see how it ends. Now, at the beginning of the movie, while Dom is working on his game, he finds out that if you have your character do this one move, that the game will glitch and delete the character completely. Okay, so the movie plants that seed early on. Now, at the end of the movie, the game comes down to one basket, of course. And in an act of, I guess you could say self-sacrifice, Bugs Bunny performs the move. But the thing is, the shot isn't even gonna make it. It just doesn't have enough juice. So LeBron has to grab the ball and then step on a bunch of power-ups in order to make the basket. So yay, the Toon Squad wins and everyone is saved. But now, because Bugs performed the move, now we have this emotional, basically a deathbed scene where Bugs Bunny is like, ah, oh, sorry everyone, I'm dying. Yeah, sorry, I'm gonna die now, I'm dying. That's all folks. And his spirit or whatever goes up into the sky and explodes. And I'm just sitting there watching this thing like, holy shit, did they just kill Bugs Bunny? So then the movie cuts to a week later where LeBron drops off his son at this game design camp. And then suddenly Bugs Bunny just appears. And LeBron is like, wait, Bugs, I thought you were dead. And Bugs Bunny is just like, well, you know, I'm a cartoon. I can survive all sorts of stuff. And that's the end of the movie. And this just pissed me off to no end. I'm sorry, I think this is incredibly lazy. You made this big deal out of establishing that any character who does this move will be erased. And then you have Bugs do the move, even though the shot wasn't even gonna make it. And then you have this tearjerker of a scene to make the audience believe that Bugs Bunny is dead, only to just have him pop up a few minutes later like, oh yeah, no, I didn't die. 
I didn't die because uh, I'm Bugs Bunny. So, so there. Then what was the point of doing all of that other than just to have this really sad scene and give the audience a cheap, you know, sense of relief at the end? I would understand if something needed to be done, you know, like one last thing that the tunes had to get together and go do in order to bring Bugs Bunny back. But no, it just resolves itself. And my problem with that is it's an unearned resolution. So throughout the story, you have conflict, as you should. There's conflict between LeBron and his son, and obviously between LeBron and Algie Rhythm. And then you have resolutions to those conflicts that are earned. So at one point, halfway through the game, LeBron realizes that you just have to be yourself and let the tunes be tunes and play their own way. And he apologizes to his son for pressuring him into basketball when his son really wants to design games. And that storyline between LeBron and his son came to a resolution. The character had a realization, made a change, and earned that resolution. This also helped the Toon Squad win the game. LeBron realized that he's just gotta let the Looney Tunes be Looney Tunes. That's the way they're gonna win. He had a realization, made the change, earned resolution. But after Bugs Bunny died, nobody had to do anything. Nothing happened. No character had to achieve anything or go up against any odds or face any challenges external or internal to bring him back. Now, looking back at the movie, you could say that this whole thing is just one big ego stroke for LeBron, but I mean, the original Space Jam did the same thing with Michael Jordan, so I'm really not surprised at how they propped him up. But what I didn't expect was the amount of self-fellatio that Warner Brothers performed on itself. Now, some people might be saying, hey, come on, man, it's just a kid's movie, whatever. And look, I get it. I mean, my nephews who are kids, they saw the movie, they enjoyed it, and that's great. Based on what I've seen online, there's a lot of people out there who enjoy the movie. But just because something's deemed a kid's movie or family-friendly, doesn't mean that it should be immune from all criticism. And furthermore, it is possible to create family-friendly entertainment that entertains kids and adults at the same time and tells a story that can be enjoyed by people at all ages. I've always felt like Pixar has done a great job at that. They've nailed that formula. And I think that's really impressive because it's not an easy thing to do. But that's pretty much it for this one as usual. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you all next time.